Thank you all for tuning in this afternoon. Today's session is Scholar Activism, the Role of Academia in Advancing Social Justice and Racial Equity, with featured speakers Natalia Linos, Magda Matake, and Jasmine Graves. And now, without further ado, let's turn to our speakers. Natalia, Magda, and, and Jasmine, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa, and uh, welcome everyone to our conversation tonight. Um, the idea behind this is that it will be informal, as if we're welcoming you into a living room. Jasmine, myself, and Magda are going to have a chance to speak about how we think about scholar activism, share a little bit about our anxieties, our tensions, the, the things that drive us, the things that motivate us. And as we all work at the FXB Center, also the vision that we have to bring scholar activism to Harvard. So today, you know, is envisioned to be conversational. And in that sense, I really invite you to put in questions, to put in comments, and we will try and multitask and, and read them uh, as you join us in this conversation. So I'm going to pass it over to Jasmine to, to kick us off, then I'll move it. To, and then Magda, will move us to a more theoretical conversation around what it means. And finally, we'll talk about FXB and, and take questions more formally, but it'll be informal, be patient with us. There might be some difficult conversations, difficult topics, and uh, we are here and uh, really glad that you've joined us today. Jasmine. Awesome, yes, thank you, Natalia. And again, welcome everyone to our living room. <laughs> So I have uh, the pleasure of kicking us off today with some grounding in what brings each of us to this institution, this moment, and this conversation. And as we'll discuss a little bit le later on, uh, leveraging scholarship to engage in activism can be a challenging mantle to take up. So I'd love to share, and I'm curious to hear from you or learn from you, Magda and Natalia, what caused you to this work, right? It can be very taxing and in, in, in my view, almost would articulate it as spiritual work. So, you know, I want to kind of get us to start thinking about like, or, or sharing what would cause us, what, because this is kind of a calling. Um, so for me, I'll share a little bit and say that my journey to this institution began when um, really I was a child trying to make sense of the Los Angeles Police Department's raid of our home. As a kid, I had to process what it meant for my uncle to be on parole and that his being on parole meant that our home was no longer ours and various carceral actors could enter whenever they pleased. So, you know, I remember feeling a lot of fear waking up to officers with their guns drawn. And over time, that fear transformed into what Brittany Cooper would call an eloquent rage and in many respects, deep in a sense of love for my people. And it was this combination of rage and love that drives my commitment to the abolition of carceral systems and the radical imagining and building of systems that fac actually facilitate safety and wellness. Um, it drove me to spaces that allowed me to leverage qualitative research to humanize the experiences of men who identify as gang members in LA, uh, to shed light on the brutality people experience behind the wall on Rikers Island, and to inform arguments uh, for investments in harm reduction and human rights over criminalization and incarceration um, during my time working at City Hall in New York City. And then finally, this rage and love has brought me back to school, <laughs> interestingly, to just didn't come back um, as a doctoral student here uh, at Harvard to strengthen my skills and my ability to support the courageous work various Black radical activists, imaginators, and organizers have been engaging in, quite frankly, for centuries. So that's what calls me uh, to this work. And, and then by this work, I mean scholar activism. And so I'm curious and would love to learn from you, Natalie and Magda, what calls you to this work? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, what a fascinating and powerful story you, you have, Jasmine. I just feel like listening to you for, you know, for the next hour and, um, and learn so much only by, uh, um, by, uh, by listening. Uh, but perhaps to, to, to get back to your question, I don't know exactly what or when my activism began because I feel that my whole life has prepared me for, for it. Um, I grew up in Romania and experienced the transition from communism to democracy as a child, sharing this room with my sister and my, my parents. And given that our father didn't have his own room to listen to the radio, 
I got to learn at a very young age about words like resistance, um, injustices, freedom from radio stations that were forbidden in, um, uh, in this uh, communist country. But in the 1990s, when Romania started to grow as a democracy, I also learned that gaining freedom to speech, opinion, thought and assembly didn't mean that Romania and Roma also gained freedom from racism, a lingering system which started in the 1300s with 500 years of enslavement. Back then, my father became a community activist, and some of the Roma leaders from Romania would gather in our front yard, as back then they didn't have spaces to meet and, and strategize. And this is how I heard and learned about the waves of anti-Roma violence across the country. Roma were collectively blamed for some, for some acts of, uh, of um, individuals and houses were put on fire and destroyed. Roma people were killed and seriously injured. And similar to you, Jasmine, I, these are the, the moments when I felt afraid, when I felt fear in, in my bones. And then when I went to, to high school, I started to understand better, to see and feel angry and feel this rage about the incidents of everyday racism that I was experiencing. But as my father who died while I was in, in high school had already introduced me to some Roma activists, I started to connect with them, volunteer, assist Roma in getting ID papers, teach math or do after school activities. And when I was, I was in college, I became more vocal and joined a Roma rights organization, first as a member and then as uh, the executive director. So prior to joining Harvard in 2012, I had had the chance, along with my colleagues at Romani Christ, to shake the school segregation practice in Romania, file complaints against the president of the country, the, for, um, uh, uh, for discriminatory statements or the prime minister and, and the minister of foreign affairs push back against police violence and racial profiling and protesting against anti-Roma racism. So somehow a slightly different version of, of me, but I would say that an, as an activist then and as a scholar or a scholar activist now, my ideas and actions have not been tied to my career as Professor Cornell West would put it uh, in a recent interview in the New Yorker. My actions are tied to, to a calling, a commitment to justice and, and anti-racism. And I wanna stop there perhaps and talk about it uh, later, but I wanna pass the floor to Natalia to, to learn a bit about her story too. Thanks so much, um, Jasmine and Magda. And Jasmine, the rage and love the putting those two together it's it's really it's really powerful because i think um this work you know scholar activism is trying to merge an emotional the rage and love with something that you know academics imagine in this you know happening in books and and literary and and without emotion kind of emotion free and and i think today's conversation is about emotions and you know my story is quite different i grew up in greece in very much a scholar household you know my parents had both uh, gone to medical school. I think my mother's story is one of struggle. You know, she grew up in a small village in a patriarchal society where girls didn't even go to school. You know, her mother went to third grade. She was expected to stop and get married. And, you know, she talks of stories of having to fight to, to go to medical school. You know, that was like outrageous. And then she came to Harvard and she still talks about it as a Greek immigrant. And um, she sat in an epidemiology class and the professor was saying something about epidemiology. And she raised her hand and said, excuse me, what is epidemiology? And he said, if you don't know what that is, you should go back to where you came from, basically in an accent. And epidemiology is a Greek word, epidemiologia. She knew what it meant. She just didn't speak, you know, and she still, I remember that sort of shame that she felt and always pushing us for an education, but having spoken to us about how it was so difficult to her, for her as an immigrant, I didn't face those difficulties. You know, I grew up in a household that really supported us. I'm one of five kids four, you know, we're four girls and uh, a younger boy, all four are professors, you know, like I do come from a scholar background. I think what for me 
I rejected scholarships. So I'm sort of surprised that I'm at Harvard right now. I had rejected it a long time. I've rejected it. As my CV says, I've, I've been here three times. I rejected it as a student and now as a staff because I've always wanted to be in, in what I imagine the real world. So I'm excited to be here because what drives me is that I know there are people like Jasmine and like Magda and students and faculty who actually want to step into this practice world. And I want to be that bridge. I've spent most of my career at the UN, um, you know, working with uh, actually movements, you know, on climate change and health. It was kind of the youth movement. I, you know, would bring together youth from the Maldives with youth from Kenya, with youth from London to speak about, you know, what they demand of the UN. And that those were the moments that inspired me. And so I see myself as um, Reverend Brother Barber calls it a footnote to the movement. He says every movement needs a footnote. And that's what we need people in academia to do to give us make sure that we're saying the right thing, give us the data and support our work. So that's one element of what drives me to be that footnote in a movement. Um, but I can't say that that's the only thing, you know, I obviously um, have political ambitions. And so I'm not going to be the grassroots um, activist necessarily, but I am going to be pushing, you know, I ran for Congress in 2020 when I was frustrated with um, the COVID inequities. I'm active right now, you know, I work in the office and then I go home at night fighting around mass mandates in Brookline because I'm on the committee that decides whether we lift them or not. So I do think that what we're hoping to do today is talk about the different ways and the different roles that we can be scholar activists. We don't, there isn't one formula and we might all work at different levels with different groups, but I think what motivates us is that bringing that emotional drive with the rigorous academic drive to together and actually making both the scholarship and hopefully the community organizing stronger. Um, so I guess, Magda, take, take it from there, because I know you've thought a lot more theoretically around how to do that. Thank you so much. And it is so interesting how your work trajectories um, show a very clear and deep sense of calling and a deep sense a, of vocation, as Professor West would call it. Both your trajectories are very, very clear in that sense. And I want to offer that sense of calling and justice as one of the central features of scholar activism. So let, let's continue our discussion by looking at scholar activism as a concept, a practice, and exploring its weight and layers as a choice, a approach, but also a label. Um, often those who describe themselves uh, or are stamped as scholar activists are academic who, academics who conduct research, teach or work on issues related to justice, anti-racism and other structural problems faced by our society. So for instance, I cannot disconnect myself and my research, my teaching from activism because of at least three reasons I would say. First, I intentionally offer my work and data to Roma communities activists and policymakers to facilitate and inform policy and law changes. Second, I use all the chances I get to share this space of power called Harvard uh, and the opportunities it brings with other Romani uh, scholars and Romani people, but also other people of color. And third, I conduct participatory action research, which involves members of Roma communities to ensure that the actual needs and wants of communities are reflected in, in my studies to ensure accountability of and objectivity in my research. But I think that um, speaking of objectivity, some academics have long, uh, long argued that scholar activists lack objectivity, neutrality in, uh, in our research. And we know that it's a very loaded statement, which codifies deeply rooted racist assumptions, particularly about researchers of scholar. This is both a, an old and a, a new story. A hundred years ago, one of the greatest sociologists of all time, W.E.B. Du Bois, was labeled by white peers and supervisors as too emotionally engaged. 
Um, there is an article uh, from 2016 that Matthew uh, Clare uh, wrote, and he talks about uh, how white scholars felt that Du Bois and other black scholars did not respect this fundamental scientific law not to mix activism with, with scholarship. And today, too, some white scholars claim that they are more driven by, by data. But so are we, so are you, Natalia, so are you, Jasmine, and so, so, so am I. Um, and so are those who are stamped as scholar activists. We collect data too. Our studies are based on uh, and driven by data as well, but often it is not the methods um, that we use or the ways we analyze data that are seen as problematic, but our identities, being them ethnic or racial identities, and our stand on social justice. Um, and I think that this pattern and also the power to define ob objectivity is a plain imitation of the old colonial mindset and an outcome of the ingrained epistemic differential power. But I will stop here because I think that there is so much to, to say uh, uh, about this. And I'd like to hear your reflections on or experiences and thoughts on scholar activism as a concept, as a practice, but also as a label. And I wonder if Jasmine, uh, would you like to continue? Oh, sure. No, I'm so uh, um, encouraged and excited that you brought up uh, W.E.B. Du Bois because I've been, you know, reflecting on him a lot in kind of preparing for this conversation. And I'm thinking a lot about Alden Morris's book, The Scholar Denied, which really chronicles everything that you've just summarized about the ways that, you know, he was regarded as, you know, um, not a pioneer in developing socio sociological theories, but kind of just seen and, and not also regarded um, appropriately for his contributions to the development of empirically based sociological research. And that piece around like you being too emotional and not, you know, it being being um, unscientific to marry activism with scholarship. So I really appreciate you bringing up W.E.B. Du Bois and just in kind of tracking with, you know, what we can learn from history. I also have been thinking a lot about Ida B. Wells, quite frankly, and thinking because I think um, when I think about scholar activism and, you know, we're having this conversation in the context of a university, you know, I um, I think sometimes we forget about the way that scholar activism is practiced outside of these walls. And Ida B. Wells makes me think a lot about that, right? As someone who was an investigative journalist and who was, you know, really carrying the mantle to fight lynch law um, across the United States, but particularly in the Jim Crow South. Um, and by and doing that by leveraging data, by literally counting, saying like these deaths in the ways that Man Dr. Nancy Krieger and Dr. Jarvis Chin have published and said that police killings, right, are um, deaths that we should care about can be counted by public health departments. Ida B. Wells made that argument back in the late 19th and 20th, 20th centuries and really kind of set a foundation for us in that regard. So, I mean, just kind of what I'm thinking right now is about the ways that like, you know, certainly um, the fights that we have in academia about, you know, what is considered true scholarship, what's, what's considered meaningful information and meaningful because it's devoid of, uh, because it's objective and neutral, which I appreciate you naming early on, the, you know, those um, kind of arguments in and of themselves are often weaponized and racist. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm just thinking a lot about Ida B. Wells, and I'm thinking about the ways that uh, a scholar activism is practiced outside of academia. And quite frankly, I'm probably also thinking a lot about that because my own work, <clears throat> my own research, most of it happened outside of an institution. It happened when I was in local government and having the privilege of working with a team and working for someone who very much saw our responsibility um, in overseeing you know, the medical and mental health care provided to people who are incarcerated, um, seeing kind of like our response, see, seeing that responsibility um, as a way, not even as a way, but with that responsibility, seeing our data, there we go, um, as a tool to really kind of like advocate and demonstrate the harms that people are experiencing um, in local jails. And then being able to kind of like connect that to arguments that people are making about prisons, right? Like there's no such thing, quite frankly, as good corrections. There's no such thing as like a healthy environment in a jail. And he very much, you know, kind of led the charge and enabled people like me and others um, on our team to kind of, again, think 
critically about our quantitative data, but then also, you know, shout out to all the qualitative research out there, out there privileging qualitative research um, as a tool to be able to kind of amplify the voices of people who are literally experiencing this harm. So the, that, that, those are just a couple of thoughts that were coming to mind for me about like the way that scholar activism is also practiced in other spaces. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about kind of like um, the ways that it shows up in grassroots kind of spaces, maybe a little later, but those are just some initial thoughts um, that I was having. Not to Leo, what's, what's coming yeah, up for you? I mean, Jasmine, you know, this centering of practice is, is what comes up for me. Oftentimes practice, and at Harvard in particular, I would say, is seen as kind of secondary, that that isn't as rigorous as, say, theoretical, kind of you're not pushing a field forward. And you you push a field forward by asking new questions. But practice is something that you do if you, you know, sort of if you're unable to do this kind of theorizing. And maybe I'm, you know, I, I'm not I'm making generalizations here. That is not true of many people. But even, you know, the three of us work at a, in public health. And at the School of Public Health, there are you know, tenure track faculty and then there are professors of practice and they don't get the same benefits. The professors of practice have, you know, term limits. And, and the, you know, the reality is the institution has sort of a two tier. Practitioners are rarely seen as, as credible, as rigorous. And I think that is something that, um, you know, as we identify the challenges of the future and, you know, I'll speak on the health. I know the audience is more mixed, you know, issues of, of inequality, issues of climate change, issues of pandemics, you know, practice is really at the heart because you can theorize about all of that. But in fact, public health is about improving the health of people. It's not about measuring and describing the health of people. It is, it should be about improving. And so scholar activism, the point, the whole purpose I see in all the research we do is to translate into a better life for individuals, a better outcome, a more equal, you know, health, life expectancy. And so I think there has been a disconnect over the years around, you know, what is the purpose of research? And that is um, where I hope we're moving for, for scholar activism or uh, scholar to practice or, you know, and, and I think your research, Magda, around sort of, um, you know, it's not community-based research, but it's really around not describing and, you know, joining with communities to describe what you're seeing, but actually using your research to bring about the change so that you're bringing about, you know, um, the change that you want to see. So public health, especially because we come from that field, but I'm sure, you know, in criminal legal scholarship in public policy, you know, that kind of the actual, you know, knowledge being able to be transferred is really important. And I do think, I want to take just one minute to talk about that, that the role of people who I call kind of the translators. And um, there are people who are able to speak both languages. They understand the research. They can read, you know, The Lancet or, you know, a really kind of dense scholarly document and understand the methods, but they can also speak to, you know, the groups, whether it's policymakers or community groups or, you know, individuals to ensure that that information is shared so that it can bring about change, that there, there is a role. And I'm not sure, you know, with one foot in academia, one foot outside of academia, maybe even, you know, a, a sort of allowing people to move in and out of spaces um, to take on those roles. And I do think that those individuals um, are rarely, rarely feel at home anywhere. And that's, you know, that's to the last part of our conversation. That's what I'm hoping to do with FXP, make a home for those people who want to be able to move between spaces, because I do think that that's critical. Um, you know, we, we think about scholarship now, we talk about how important it is to have, you know, multidisciplinary and people connecting across their thematic areas, but actually we really should be talking about people connecting across their, their practice, their worlds of academia and practice and community and politics, I think, to bring about the change we need. I think you are right. And I think we also have to, to, to discuss some of the tensions and conflicts that you mentioned, because it's, it's hard to be uh, with a foot in one world and uh, one uh, in the other, for instance, very often, because I use participatory action research and I have, I work in partnership with, uh, with nonprofit organizations and uh, informal groups. Very often when we, we are to collect data and to publish studies, we, we have these two you know, tensions. One is uh, the pressure that comes from the university uh, to publish in journal articles. The other one is the interest of, uh, of our you know, research group to publish uh, 
in you know on on the website so that everyone has access to 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 a study or another so i think there is there is this need to to discuss how our work and our approaches and our uh, values affect our um uh, our work and the way that at least in in the framework that we have today and perhaps a different conversation is how do we decolonize the university so that we we accept these uh, uh, these practices in in, in a more um, uh, inclusive way. But I wonder if you have any thoughts, Jasmine or Natalia, uh, on on tensions on how we navigate these spaces. <laughs> Absolutely. As soon as you said uh, decolonize the university, I said, "Wow!" <laughs> I felt tension certainly uh, build in my spirit. Thinking about you know being here, you know, in an institution that was literally built by enslaved African people. I'm like, what does it mean to, to decolonize this space where that kind of, um, that torture is literally in, built into the bricks. It's built into the literal foundation of where we're working. Um, so yeah, that is certainly a real tension for me. Also this piece around, I think I've been in a lot of conversations and even tussled for myself, this piece around, um, kind of like lending credibility to organizers or lending credibility to movement spaces, you know, when it's like, um, I, yeah, I guess I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't thought as much about how do I uh, um, drum up energy or, you know, invest energy in decolonizing this space and been thinking more about like, you know what, almost, I, I mean, I very much appreciate my stipend and being here, but almost like forget this space. <laughs> um, and like, instead, like I'm more excited by the kind of collectives that are emerging, uh, that are a mix of organizers and scholars and a mix of people who have, you know, different sets of skills working together um, to kind of like put forth ra new radical ideas or really just amplify the ideas people have been saying over time. So I'm thinking a lot about, for example, um, there's a lot of work across the the country around reimagining public safety or reimagining safety. People are redefining and saying, like, actually, safety is not about safety is not defined in these criminogenic terms. It's not about having more police. And in fact, that creates more, you know, uh, that creates a lack of safety for many people. But what it really is, is about people having their human rights, right? It's about having quality housing it's a, and, and stable housing. It's about, you know, having access to food. It's about having um, the ability to, to, like, care for yourself and your loved ones and thrive. And the people doing that work are, are folks like the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. It's, like, it's, it's organizations like One Hood Media out in Pittsburgh who are putting forth these really, I think, exciting um, reports that certainly speak to data that are, you know, put forth by various local governments that are put forth from different academic institutions like Harvard. But I, I guess I'm just more excited about kind of like that space uh, and, and, and like thinking about how can I lend what I'm learning here almost in a like the, the book that's coming to mind for me right now is this book, The Spook Who Sat By The Door. I don't know if you all are familiar. It's by Sam Greenlee, published in the 70s, but it's about this man who worked uh, as a special assistant in the CIA for the purpose of gaining all the skills to then leave the CIA and train up people uh, um, on the South side of Chicago to kind of like resist. So that's kind of more of my interest is like almost a siphoning and this is recorded and this is a little awkward, so. Um, still very much appreciate my stipend and being here. <laughs> but almost a siphoning of those skills are really a taking back, right, of the labor that my people put in this institution to support advocacy efforts um, that I think are most meaningful and that will actually help us see the change that we want to see. I mean, I think, Jasmine, you're not alone. I mean, I think that's the hard thing. Harvard has this, I mean, there is the history that we need to, to deal with, but also this image but it doesn't mean that there aren't individual scholars who are struggling, who who don't bring up their lived experience in classes because they're worried about how that will reflect, who may not um, talk about their struggles today, you know, with, with food insecurity. You know, I think there is this kind of disconnect of who is Harvard and reclaiming that. And you saying, I, Jasmine, I am a first year doctoral student at Harvard and I am here and I deserve to be here is sort of, I do think we, we need that right now. And, and I don't know, it's not enough, obviously. And what I worry about Magda, and now, you know, I put on my hat of, of a director of a center that has postdocs who I'm kind of encouraging to take on that um, spirit and to really embrace and to spend time um, supporting, you know, if there is public testimony on, say, a bill 
in Massachusetts on incarceration to spend time you know, giving public testimony, because I think that's an important role. I do worry, you know, I, I need to be honest, I do worry that am I sending people on a track that then there will be backlash for their careers, right? I, I'm pretty, I'm fine. I have my career. So I do have this anxiety of like, am I setting people astray? But the questions I've asked people is like, no, you're not, because this is kind of the future of academia. Um, it will le lend to better research. And, you know, there was a question um, that Rose is like, you know, how do you build street cred as an academic? And I think the the answer to that is, you know, do you actually, and I'll, I'll click that I'm answering in live, do, are you actually, you know, street cred is earned and it requires time. And I don't know if I will ever get there, but, you know, Jasmine, in your area, like, is it, are you being both accountable to and responsive of the needs and a continuous engagement. And I think Harvard has failed too many times. Um, you know, the School of Public Health is not in Cambridge. We are in a community that, you know, like that has experienced such disinvestment and we could have done better by just our, our sheer proximity. And we should, and, and I hope we will, Magda. I think, you know, your, your question is hard and at the individual level, it's a hard choice to, to make, but I think that we all have a moral responsibility to share our data, our results, and what we do with, with the public. We don't just research populations for our own curiosity and for our own CV. We research uh, to, to provide this information to the public and to improve policies and, uh, and so on. So what I would say is that it's not just the responsibility of scholar activists, it's not just the responsibility of scholars of color to, uh, to use this data for, for the greater purpose, but it's the responsibility of all of us at Harvard who, who are conducting research with people to actually go a step further and take the time to, uh, to have these testimony, testimonies prepared for, for different institutions, take the time to, to testify, take the time to, to send recommendations to various policymakers. But at the same time, the leadership of Harvard and the leadership of any university should take this into consideration as an added value to what we do, not, not as a minus to what we, uh, what we do. So I think that this is where I think decolonizing the universities is, 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 is relevant in, um, uh, in making um, perhaps the opportunities better for, for all of us and lifting the voices of, of everyone up and just accepting the reality as it is. We, we have to speak uh, about injustices. We have to, to share our data and information. But there is a question about uh, uh, in, in the chat, which I hope we can take a minute to, to respond. And I don't know if Jasmine or Natalia would like to, to answer to this question, but it, uh, um, uh, our colleague is asking, what are the most impactful things that one can do to fight racial injustice as a scholar activist. And I wonder if you can just share one or two, uh, two ideas. The thing that comes up for me is um, I think a lot about who, who, who am I led by or who are we led by. Um, so in my practice, especially when I was knee deep in government, I always had uh, was sure that I was a part of an organizing collective, you know, because um, let me just take a step back and say, uh, when I was knee deep in documenting cases of brutality um, and like, you know, sit, being in the jails day in and day out, seeing that um, kind of like heinous violence over time, I found myself getting a little desensitized. So when I first came in, it was like I'd be crying talking to people, you know, who had these orbital fractures, these jaw fractures, these really terrible injuries. That's when I first came in. By the time I left, a jaw fracture became like you know, and, and, and just a fixture of, a, of my everyday experience, you know? Um, so I say that to say that there's a way that these institutions can like desensitize you, you know what I mean? By virtue of just being there over a period of time. And so it was important for me early on, I recognized, right? Like I need to maintain my um, connection to my involvement with my engagement with my organizing community and be led by them in my work. Because if I just stay in this, Inst this institution, this, if I just, if this consumes me, it's going to change me. 
Um, so that, I think that's a kind of critical piece in like, you know, leveraging scholar activism or, you know, research and academia um, to engage in work to fight injustice. It's like asking yourself, who are you led by? You know what I mean? What's your connection to the people who are most uh, impacted by the systems of oppression that you're, you're you know, seeking to fight. Because quite frankly, people are experts of their own experience. And it's just by virtue of racism and other systems of oppression that their voices, that their expertise is not privileged in the ways that ours are. So that's that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind for me is just like, who, ask yourself, who are you led by? Um, and if it's not the person <laughs> or people that you are um, writing about, then you, there might be some things to reconcile. Thank you so much for that. And maybe, Natalia, this is the, the time for, for us to, to shift to, to the FXB Center and perhaps think about our work at the FXB Center in relation to this question in particular. Yeah, and I think the question, what are the most impactful things that you can do to fight racial injustice as a scholar activist? It's a complex question, and I don't think there's a single answer. And I think what you can take from today's conversation is that actually there's a lot that you can do that is impactful with a different hat on. Like if you are really driven by say, you know, quantitative research and you are working, like our team is working on making a public health case for reparations. There's a lot you can do because there is no scholarship there. And actually making the public health case that shows that, you know, an investment of reparations could end, you know, these, these kind of sound bites that politicians like to use with numbers and figures, like those are valuable. So there's value there. If you are someone who really is able to um, join kind of a community movement and support, you, you know, be that kind of translation, you know, take on that role. For me personally, I have found that the most impactful place is to just enter politics like right now. You know, I am in the conversations in Brookline about uh, lifting mass mandates and, you know, I, declined to lift them in schools. And I got a lot of hate kind of, it was lifted. You know, I didn't, I didn't win that battle, but, you know, putting myself out my name, my Harvard title and saying, I disagree with this right now because it's going to have an inequitable impact. You know, I felt that, you know, the most impactful thing I can do is be in those political spaces. But that comes from the fact that, you know, I am a white woman with three Harvard degrees and a privileged background. And I am, you know, I, I have learned about myself that I communicate well in those spaces. And so I knowing yourself and where you can have the biggest impact, I think is a better question than where can we all have a bigger impact? And then it's the collective. And that takes me to Magda, to your question about what are we trying to do at FXB? We're trying to build a collective that actually values people for their strengths at different levels. And, you know, I'm so excited that Magda is a first year doctoral student, but her wealth of experience and, you know, you Magda don't have a public health degree, but you have, you know, all the political science and the, the theory and the, the history. And, you know, we have both global scholars and US centric, and we're trying to, to cross over the, the fact that actually racism, you know, anti-black Racism exists everywhere in the world. It's very pronounced in the U.S. and codified, but it's in Brazil. It's, you know, what, you know, I grew up in Greece and Magda, you know, the anti-Roma racism in Greece is so real and it's still going on today. Um, and so kind of, anyway, so that's just to say FXB is trying to become a home for people, but the privilege that we have is that we have resources that, you know, we have found foundations to support this work. I think if we were strapped for resources, it would be a difficult place to be. So there are some kind of the bottom line, you know, the institution, the Dean of the School of Public Health really supports this vision. You know, we are protected in that way and we're able to, to sort of grow. And so I'm excited and, you know, I wanna put a pitch for anyone in the audience who is a current student, um, or a faculty member who wants to kind of join our, our collective, like it is, it feels somewhat as a collective and it has a very uh, bottom up kind of approach, the researchers, but, you know, some specifics around how do you foster kind of an academic an institution is one, I, you know, there was a very intentional cluster hire of postdocs um, that were all hired to work on the same area on, on structural racism and health from different perspectives, environmental, maternal health, but kind of to work together. Because as Jasmine and Magda has said, a lot of this work is exhausting and it is emotionally exhausting as well as intellectually exhausting. And that actually having a peer network of support is just as important as having sort of the mentor who can guide you on, you know, how do you 
statistically address this, like that the peer kind of network of emotional support, I think is really important, um, giving each other space. But for me at FXB, my priority is actually the translational piece. We have a really strong communications team and we have a community organizer. I don't know how many Harvard centers have a community organizer to stand side by side. And I don't know, her, her title is community engagement manager, but she came from a community organizing space to stand side by side to ensure that our research is accountable and reflective. And I think that is, you know, where we're trying to innovate. And of course, we have to and can do much better. Uh, Magda, you've been there much longer. So I don't know what you you hope to see of the FXB Center. Well, I think we are in the process of breaking a wall. Um, at, at Harvard, in a sense that uh, uh, now we have a uh, quite a good number of, of postdoctoral students and doctoral students and grad students, postdoctoral fellows. Sorry if I said students uh, who who are working with us um, on structural racism using data. Um, organizing and being very creative in the ways in which they look at various aspects of, of structural racism. I think they are all amazing. They are producing good data. They are producing good reports, good studies that are going to be translated for Harvard, but also for, for the larger community. So in a way we show a path is not the only path uh, that is available, but I think that the fact that um, the, this team and the FXB Center is ready to, to make our research and articles available to the communities affected, to activists, to policymakers. That's, that's a big uh, and important step, although it seems simple, but I haven't seen that being done at Harvard too, too much. Uh, I think we, we are doing a lot of solidarity work, and that's also relevant in terms of how we break these walls that are very much uh, um, um, walls that are very much spaces of, um, of uh, that are silos, basically. So we are trying to break walls and just become a larger community. And I think it's also important for each of, and every one of us, and some at the FXB Center have started to, to do so, to, to speak up uh, about uh, how we... We change our syllabi, spaces, leadership, and uh, and everything, so that we uh, we really feel that we uh, we embrace race, uh, um, uh, racial justice, that we embrace so social justice, and so on. So I think it's it's a path, it's a new way, and we'll see how it goes. But I, I trust our fellows and the students a lot, and I'm so excited uh, to to have them on board. I know we need to to QA, but not to leave me, I just offer a quick perspective as a student in FXB. I, um, I think it's important. I think we've said this in many different ways, um, but I just want to kind of put a pin on the fact that, you know, um, um, racism, sexism, heterosexism, the various systems of oppression are not fixtures of yesteryear at Harvard. They're very much present today. <laughs> and I think, you know, I've only been here since um, September and I can feel it. I can feel it in certain classes and certain spaces. And I think the other value of FS, FXB and I see that there's a question in the chat about, you know, um, an experience about being actively antagonized, you know, perhaps by your boss or institution. FXB is almost um, a safe haven for many of us. I mean, speaking from the perspective of, of, of students um, and like, a safe haven to be able to do the work and be supported in the work that you know is meaningful, and important, whether that be about literally, you know, doing studies to quantify the impacts of racism, doing studies to support arguments for reparations, but it's also a space, you know what I mean, as a human being to kind of like be held and recognized and, and valued. Um, so I think that um, I just wanted to quickly offer that, you know, you know, uh, kind of, I don't know, perspective as a student um, who's relatively new here and, and already seeing the ways that this university continues to be harmful in a lot of ways through, um, through classroom spaces and particularly antagonistic um, uh, towards black students. So having, you know, so many <laughs> black folks just to be quite frank in FXB um, has really been a kind of a beautiful experience for me. Um, just given that there's not very <laughs> many of us <laughs> in other spaces in the university. So I appreciate also that FX3 is kind of a safe haven. May I just add to that and perhaps answer to the same question that find allies. Whenever you, you, you feel that you are alone, try to find allies. At Harvard, since I arrived, I tried to, to create spaces of solidarity 
spaces of friendship with different uh, communities, with different scholars. We've got the support of Professor Cornell West and others who have always been there next to us, lifting us and lifting our, our voices. So whenever you, you are able to, to find allies, just try to create these spaces of solidarity and it is, uh, your work is going to be easier. I think you're right. And, you know, the question both about feeling actively antagonized and also there was a question in the audience and I've moved to questions in the audience now. Um, you know, Miles Rodriguez, who's based in Hudson, New York, he says that I'm a professor at a liberal arts college for a decade. I write about activism. I found it nearly impossible to do activism in addition to teaching research and service and how, you know, that does not get reframed as community service work in the evaluation. And, you know, what are the practical um, answers. And, you know, I would say none of us are, are probably well equipped to answer that question because none of us are tenure track faculty. And I know that's a very different um, kind of, you know, evaluations. And, and I do think institutions and universities are trying to do better to include at least not community service in the way you're saying it, but sort of the, the practice piece there. But, you know, some of the practical ways that, um, for example, I take time to be active in the political spaces and, you know, is, is to make sure that, that I, I make the connections, you know, I, I think somebody had asked a question also about how do we do it in a way that, you know, allows us our academic neutrality? Like when do you cross the line? And, and, you know, at FXB, we've tried to, we've come close to what is considered lobbying, but we're not lobbying. We're using research and data, but we are pretty explicit about using our research and data to bring about change. And I think that's an important, you know, you need to have leadership that, that values that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy answer. So I don't know if anybody else uh, wants to take that on kind of practical ways. Uh, Magda, I think you do it really well. Um, you kind of jump at different levels. Yeah. So one thing that I do is to, uh, participate in events, give give my opinions, give my uh, policy advice in various spaces. But most of the time, I use the research that we we conduct at Harvard to to inform my recommendations or to to make my my points. So there is always a connect between what I research and what what I put on the table of various policymakers or uh, uh, um, the critique that I put on various uh, um, uh, various policies or uh, academic work and and so on but i think that miles is is right very often these these activities do not really count as academic activities um, and again that has to to be changed and i think it takes all of us speaking about it, all of us claiming this work as actual work, as important work first, our responsibility to actually share what we know with, with the world and with the policymakers. So this is how I would frame it, but I don't have an answer to, to how to convince the universe because I haven't succeeded to do so. And I mean, I think on that note, there's another question I want to uh, highlight. Um, it says the burden and backlash of this work or any type of activism within an organization often falls on women of color. At the same time, women of color typically don't get credit or acknowledgement for the difficult work. How do we ensure that the most marginalized aren't the only ones carrying this work? So I want us to take a few minutes to talk about backlash um, because that's real. And um, that is something that when you enter this space, whether it's backlash on social media or real people showing up, you know, we, we have colleagues um, at FXB who have worked on anti-racist um, medicine, and then there were neo-Nazis, you know, protesting like live. So a lot of this work is not only um, emotionally draining, but it can, you know, the backlash can be very real, especially if you are um, a woman of color or someone who has another sort of mark. So I don't know if somebody wants to talk to either the backlash piece or, you know, this is lack of acknowledgement and how do we bring in others to do the work with us? Maybe it's like my fight me spirit, but <clears throat> I very much kind of feel sometimes like if I'm not getting backlash, am I doing it right? <laughs> um, if I'm not stirring up and creating discomfort for people, am I, am I actually, you know, telling the whole truth? So, so that's just the kind of the first thought that kind of, but I, what, what also comes to mind is the importance of having a community of care. You know what I mean? So I appreciate Magda's point around like having allies and um, 
across the university or in, you know, different spaces to support each other in one of the work, but it's equally or not, but, and it is equally as important to have communities of care to hold us, right? And to be, when these moments of backlash occur, when people question, you know what I mean? And kind of gaslight you in these spaces, right? Like we know, just using structural racism as an example, that it's real in this country because it's existed for over 300 years at this point or close to it, 246 years of enslavement. Okay. This country, pre, when it was a, a colony, the point is that it, it has existed, it has been studied, it has been quantified for a very long time and still there are questions about it. So, you know, and, and so that's what I mean when I say like we kind of get gaslit still in these spaces. I think it's important to have those communities of care, to have what I affectionately call a village people who, you know, will just have fellowship with you. Sometimes, you know, I think it's equally important to, you know, see joy and love as forms of resistance. You know what I mean? Um and just even in my time, I'll just speak about Harvard specifically, you know, a lot of, you know, who I've come to view and um, see as family in my program, we have, you know, monthly fellowships because we recognize it's really important just to sit and break bread with each other, to sit and check in and be like, how, how's your spirit? How's your heart? How are you doing? So I think that, you know, in, in these spaces that gets viewed as like, oh, that's like a woo-woo thing that's not not real, that's not tangible. But actually, the, I would argue there's nothing more tangible than love, care, and support, or the many ways that love um, is um, kind of reflected or enacted. So that that's just a couple of my thoughts. I think that I, I I'm on, on the same page with with Jasmine. Uh, I I know, and I've known this for twenty plus years that the work that I do does not make uncomfortable only neo-Nazis and uh, far-right people, but also progressive uh, white people. So I expect uh, discomfort, I expect reactions, and I know that I'm often stamped as the Roma woman, not the scholar, not the Harvard scholar, not the Harvard grad or anything. It's mostly my, my ethnic identity and it doesn't, uh, I, I don't shy away from it. I, I embrace it. I, um, I'm, I'm happy with it. It's just that how it is framed when, when I'm called that. Um, and I, I think it's uh, it, it, your identity by itself receives backlash. So aside from all these other layers, being a scholar, being an activist and all that, the identity itself uh, creates a, a backlash. I, I think that in, in the scholarship, what makes me very upset is when uh, scholars feel that my research, which is not just my own, I work with data analysts at Harvard. Most of them are non-Roma because we don't have Roma at Harvard and, uh, and all that, but yet, my the my research is office often seen as um a subjective because i'm one of the, of the authors and yet i think it we never really shift the coin and think what about white scholars who are making this argument? Do they feel that they are objective? Don't they have any interest actually? Don't they benefit from the system of uh, white supremacy? Uh, don't they have these uh, ideas based on the systems that created the uh, race and that created uh, hierarchies, human hierarchies? So I think it's, it's also, you know, this tension between who has the power to name who, and I struggle with that uh, uh, a lot. And uh, Natalie, I, I don't know if you want to add something, but I, uh, I feel that that's perhaps the thing that yeah. gives me rage still. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm very conscious that we just have a couple minutes, but onto that, you know, there's someone in the in our Q and A who has kind of is is trying to sort of ask us that question of, you know, do you support the right of other scholars who utilize the same data but come to different conclusions about social policy to present their ideas to their students? Or if some of your students disagree with you, uh, do you openly state the former are incorrect? I think the question that Isaac is asking, and, you know, to what extent do the ideas of scholars have to conform to the official position of the university? I mean, I think that there is kind of scholarship that is both, you know, we have made our political kind of ideology pretty known, but, you know, what if a, a more right-wing kind of conservative, like, do they have the right to teach and to interpret the data? And, and how do we, how do we do that in a way that protects students? I don't know. I mean, do Jasmine, I see you nodding. I'm going to yeah. give it to you. And then I'll <laughs> I got some 
Well, well the first thought I have is I just think about, um, I think it's a question of, uh, of ethics, right? Like I think um, in medicine and public health, um, people, you know, there's like an oath around like doing no harm, right? If you're, I, I, I saw a tweet and it's funny that like Twitter has now also become like, <laughs> you know, a source for <laughs> intellectual ideas, <laughs> articles, what have you. But the, the point the person was making is that, you know, um, well, what they simplified it to is bad ideas become bad policies. And I would say harmful ideas, hateful ideas become harmful and hateful policies. So I actually, I, I per, my personal politics is I, I don't, really hold space for that. And I think it's important um, to address it or to challenge it um, when, at least when I see it in class or when I see it among colleagues um, in practice. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think it's okay. I think if what you're putting forward is potentially harmful to someone or will reinforce a system that is violent or, or harmful to a, a community of people, then it's, it's, it's not okay. And it needs to be, I think, um, articulated and recognized as such. And I also believe that, you know, when you conduct research with people and populations that you don't belong to, I think it's mandatory to employ reflexivity and think about your own, you know, position in, in, in that research to make sure that you work with, uh, with the communities affected uh, and all that, because that may, may impact your, uh, your data analysis in a way which uh, uh, may uh, harm communities. So much, Jasmine, and thank you, Magda. I'm not going to add to that. I'm going to pass it back to Melissa, but thank you everyone for engaging with us and uh, really making this uh, a difficult but meaningful conversation and as we move forward um, on scholar activism. Melissa, over to you. Thank you, Natalia, Magda, and Jasmine. And thanks to all of you who joined us today. We hope you'll join us for more signature events, including our next webinar, which will be held on April 4th, featuring... Um, the Harvard Business School professor, Robin Eli, on getting serious about workplace diversity. Information about our upcoming events, as well as recordings of our past ones, can be found at vpal.harvard.edu slash vpal events. Good night, everyone, and thank you for being a part of the conversation.